So I am pleased to introduce uh, Peter Sternberg from Indiana University, uh, who will speak about the 1D model for cholesteric liquid crystals with disparate elastic constants. So, Peter. Thank you, Ayman. Thank you to the organizers for giving me this uh, chance to, to talk about my work. I appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to talk ab about, in the beginning, I want to talk about so, uh, uh, just a general uh, kind of program I've been trying to pursue with, with uh, some collaborators, in particular with Dmitry Golovati. And, uh, uh, and this particular project is with Michael Novak that, that correspond to some modeling of, of liquid crystals in which uh, certain modes of deformation, certain elastic constants are much larger than others. So, um, so I'll talk about the, a little bit of the general story at first, in particular mention a little bit about the modeling in case people are not so familiar with uh, liquid crystal modeling. And then, then I'll focus on a kind of a simple 1D problem that we were looking at recently. Okay, oh, won't let me advance. All right, I guess I'll do this manually. Let's see. Okay, so um, so let me say a little bit about modeling. So so in general, with liquid crystal modeling, let's say you have some. Uh, to begin with, I'll look, let's think about a three-dimensional domain. Though later in the talk, I'll specialize just to a one D model. Uh, so you know, there there. I guess one of the oldest models is the Osin Frank model, uh, which um, uh, involves a director and S two valued uh, uh, vector field that kind of uh, indicating the, the the local orientation of your of your liquid crystal molecules, uh, and then there's another um, um, uh, mo common model that 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 is has certain advantages over Osin Frank, the Landau de Gennes Q tensor theory, where you're modeling based on a on a three by three symmetric tensor, where the second moments are are what what are kind of most most relevant and the and the the eigenvectors of, of this Q tensor somehow are, are giving you the, the the local orientation. So I'm, I'm going to tell you about a simple kind of toy problem, but but uh, just mention that that we've been able to kind of upgrade from our toy models to the to the to the Landa de Gens theory in, in various uh, studies we've done. So but but anyway, these these are the two of the most common models. So um, um yeah so so in general you know the whatever your model you you want to kind of capture the elastic distortions of this liquid crystal field so that is you know your energy is going to be something involving derivatives of your director n or of your of your q tensor your three by three matrix q and uh um sorry i'm having trouble advancing it there we go then and then typically there's some kind of uh, boundary conditions, which in the language of liquid crystal modeling is the anchoring. Uh, uh, so you might have the director pointing outwards, uh, the so-called homeotropic anchoring or tangential anchoring or anything in between. Okay. Um, so uh, this is kind of, uh, so, so the, you know, the, the, the Osin Frank model was really based on kind of splitting up the deformations into, into different types. And so, um, so here, you know, you, you have uh, you, you, the, the splay, the, the, so, so the, the one term involves a divergence, how much the, the director is spreading. Uh, the one that'll be most important for the, for the majority of this talk is this, this one involving the, the twist. So here you look at the amount that the curl is in the direction of the director itself. And then Q is, is somehow, this is the 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 kind of what's called the cholesteric term here that that tells you how much this thing is twisting and what what how much twist it prefers, let's say. Uh, and then there's the amount that the curl is orthogonal uh, to n. This is measuring the, the bend of these molecules. There's a, another term here, what's called the saddle splay, which I won't say anything about. It turns out it's a null Lagrangian. It's it, it's something that can be integrated away in terms of boundary conditions. So so basically you have splay, you have twist, and you have bend. And and uh, um, okay, so so um, um, so what we've been looking at in, in, in recent years is uh, Dmitry Golovati and some work with with 
Raga Venkatraman, and today I'll talk a lot about some work with Michael Novak. Is you know, it, it turns out that that um, certain kinds of liquid crystals uh, are have the property that, as you say, very temperatures, you very certain concentrations. There's dramatic shift in terms of what kinds of deformations are favored. That is, you know, they can measure, you know, in some sense, the, the coefficient of the splay or the coefficient of the twist and can kind of design settings where, where maybe one of these deformations is practically free energetically or other deformations are incredibly expensive and are prohibited. And, and this live, gives rise to a lot of interesting morphologies and it's something that hasn't perhaps been explored that much so far in, in the mathematical literature. And so that was really uh, what we wanted to look at. In particular, we've been, we talk a lot with and have worked with, with uh, uh, Oleg uh, uh, Lavrentovich who, over at the Liquid Crystal Institute at Kent State who has done a lot of experiments and, and has been very generous in talking with us about, about some of the modeling we've been pursuing. So we've been trying to capture, uh, oops, that, um, so some of some of the morphologies, let's say that 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 he and others are seeing in their experiments. So I'll tell you just a little bit about about a study we did uh, um, a couple of years back, in which we looked at a setting where the splay. So K one is the coefficient of that divergence term. It measures how expensive it is to to spread or display. So we looked at a, a model that's asymptotic in the sense that that the splay is much more expensive than the other deformations. So I'll tell you a little bit about. That and then I want to show you a, a kind of a, again a toy problem in which we we wanted to explore okay what happens when when the the, the twist when you have a so-called cholesteric liquid crystal that prefers in its in this kind of uh, natural state to be to be spiraled or twisted what happens when that coefficient is is much more expensive when when there's a kind of a big penalty there so okay so let me tell you about this. Uh, um, um, some of the modeling we, we came up with. Again, so here, uh, apologies. I mean, I'm, I'm, I talked about Osin Frank and uh, Landau de Gens for those who are familiar with liquid crystal modeling. We're, uh, the, the rest of the talk is about some toy models. That is where we, where we look at just a, say a, a vector field. Um, so not, not, not required to be uh, S2 valued and, and not, not a three by three symmetric matrix, just a vector field uh, and the domain um, could be 1D, 2D, 3D, but but in our in our kind of toy modeling, first of all, we kind of relax that. If you want to think of this as kind of like Osteen Frank, where you have a S2 valued order parameter, here we relax it with a potential. Uh, I'll talk about the potentials we use in a minute, but these are potentials that in particular would favor, for example, S1 or S2 valued states. And then again, so so here are the th this looks like the Osteen Frank model again, splay term twist term that has to do with the cholesteric modeling and then the bend term. Okay, so which potentials were we considering? So the, the you know, to, the obvious one to pick if you wanna kind of think of this as a relaxation of Osin Frank where, where you're relaxing the S2 valuedness is, is or S1 valuedness depending on your dimension is to take a Ginsburg-Landau uh, potential. So W sub, the GL standing for Ginsburg land, you just take mod U squared minus one squared. And so for epsilon small, that would kind of push things towards being uh, unit valued, unit modulus. And then we're also looked at some problems. I don't, I'm not gonna get into this today, but I'll just mention we, we, did, we were interested in, in uh, modeling what are called isotropic pneumatic phase transitions. So, you, you know, when, this, when the liquid crystal is in the, uh, is basically, uh, ordered and is pointing in locally in, in, in particular direction and you have, a, in terms of the mathematics, let's say you have something like an Osteen Frank situation where it's, where it's S2 value. We call that in, in, in the pneumatic state, but you could also have a totally disordered state, which in this toy problem would be when U is zero. So that says there really is no local ordering. And so that's another potential one can take to, to allow for coexistence of, of uh, favoring a zero state isotropic and an S2 or S1 valued state pneumatic. Okay. All right, so that's kind of a starting point for, for, for the various models we looked at. Um, let, me, um, let me attempt to go on here. Wow, there we go. Um, uh, gee, 
sorry, I don't know why this, there we go. Uh, so, so, uh, in, so in one model, let me tell you a little bit about this model where we thought, you know, we looked at what happens when the, the splay, when the spreading is far more expensive than everything else. Okay, so, so this is, so there's no uh, particular uh, favoring of, of, of chirality or of a cholesteric state. So that's where this Q, which remember went with that twist term is zero here. So, so if you like, you know, at rest, this thing doesn't want to be uh, in, in a spiral. And, and so we were just looking at a nomadic uh, situation. So we took the Ginsburg Landau potential. Think again of that as just relaxing the, the, uh, the, the unit modulus condition. We looked at a planar domain, so omega's in the plane. And so our, our, in this toy problem, our order parameter is just a map from this two-dimensional domain into R2. So there's just, so we're just gonna take, I'm, I'm gonna rename this, this favored, uh, coefficient, so to speak, just call it L, that's the coefficient of splay. Think of that as just some order one quantity. But suppose the coefficients of, of the other, other deformations are small, order epsilon. So, so in this toy problem, there are just two parameters here, the coefficient of splay, L, and then everybody else is kind of stuffed into, uh, you know, something, this is kind of, the other deformations are very cheap. So we have the Ginsburg-Landau potential, and then uh, a splay term, and then a, a very cheap, if you will, uh, term collecting any other kinds of deformations. Okay. And then a boundary condition to kind of drive the problem, some S1 valued boundary condition G. All right. So, so here the question is, what, you know, let me, maybe to orient to things, let me point out before I go further, if L were zero, which is most definitely not in our case, this is nothing more than the famous uh, uh, Brazis Betuel Elan problem. Uh, but for us here, uh, quite, quite the opposite of this, L is, is not zero, it's, it's bigger than, than the other deformation. So L is order one here. And the question is, what happens when you, when you, we want to explore what happens in terms of morphologies when you have the splay is very expensive. Okay, so what's some intuition about this? Um, um, so as epsilon goes to zero, okay, the Ginsburg-Landau potential says, okay, you're pushing the solution towards unit modulus. That divergence term, remember, had no epsilons in front of it. So even in, a, in some kind of limit, uh, the divergence is still going to be L2, some kind of limiting value of, think of U as like the limiting value of a minimizer as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, it's still going to have L2 divergence. Um, on the other hand, one finds that, you know, you're going to lose part of the boundary condition potentially because, uh, you know, you don't have an H1 limit. So you don't, the traces aren't going to be preserved necessarily. But just from the divergence theorem, uh, one can easily argue that the normal component of the, of the boundary condition should survive even in the limit. Okay, so, um, but here's, here's the interesting part of the story, which is that, um, you know, in the limit, and by the way, I keep saying limit, what I'm really thinking about is something like a gamma convergence question, a gamma limit. But, but uh, in the limit, you can have uh, you know, a function that, ha that, that is in, has an L2 divergence can undergo jump discontinuities. And, and indeed, as we find that that's exactly what happens in, in general for this problem. So you can have, say, remember we're in 2D here. So you can have jumps over curves and, you know, calling the traces, say, U plus and U minus. You can have some jump curves, say, J sub U. Uh, and again, from the divergence theorem, you know, just from, from uh, basically integration by parts, the jumps can't be arbitrary. The normal component across such a jump has to be continuous. So if you think about it, the normal component has to be continuous. It has to be unit valued. So what that says is the only other direction, the tangential component could switch sign. And that indeed is, it, is what can happen over various, over curves, let's say. Um, okay. And so this turns out to be uh, the, our conjecture for the gamma limit. We have a a proof of this, for example, under the assumption that the limit is in BV. Uh, but but uh, so, so what you find is that again, remember the divergence term didn't carry any epsilons with it. So in the limit, this is preserved. This is the, you just get the L times the, the, the cost of uh, times the splay term, divergence squared. But what about this term? You get the jump cubed. Um, where does this come from? Again, all that can happen across a jump set is the tangential component switches sign. 
So it's just kind of a scalar transition in the jump in, in the tangential component from, from minus whatever it is to plus whatever it is. That, that 1D transition is, is ex given that we're working with the Ginsburg Landau potential ends up being exactly, for those of you who are familiar with it, exactly a Modica Mortula, or if you like an Allen Kahn type transition. Uh, and, and when you write it down, it's just, I won't bother with it, but just a couple lines, you find that the cost for a Ginsburg Landau potential of a 1D transition like that is the, the, the size of the jump cubed. It's just a little uh, back of the envelope calculation. Again, maybe to orient some people, depending on your backgrounds, this is this jump cube for some people will be very familiar because this is exactly what happens in the celebrated Avilas Giga problem uh, uh, in, in uh, calculus of variation. So, so it's that same same mechanism from from the Avilas Giga term. But anyway, uh, all I want to say that's all I'm going to say about this this uh, 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 study. But just just uh, to summarize, when you make the splay very expensive. Then in the limiting problem, the, the, the so-called gamma limit, you get you get the, the the cost of the splay, okay, and then you also potentially get a jump cost. The you know you should think of that as saying that that because jumps because the the splay is so expensive at times it is it is energetically preferable to just make a jump rather than to have so much spreading, and and. Uh, so we and we looked at examples where indeed this happens and some numerics and indeed you have these this effect. Okay, so that's that's one uh, problem. And now I want to spend the rest of my talk on something we just kind of finished recently, um, where we wanted to see okay what happens when the twist is the deformation that that, that costs the most money, so to speak. So so this is some work with Michael Novak. Um, so let me say a word about these cholesteric or, or chiral modeling. So, um, so here again, so we have this Q term here, suppose Q is now positive or, or is non-zero, let's say. And then, you know, if you go, going back to Osin Frank, what, what, what do we, what is the kind of, how to think about this, this cholesteric setting? Well, here's what we call a pure twist. If you take this unit vector, you know, zero and then cosine QX and sine QX, this is, the minimizer if you don't you know, stress the problem with any boundary condition, just a pure twist. And so you know, this is a twist aligned along the x-axis. So this thing is just uh, twisting around at a, at a uniform rate and, and one can easily check that you know, its divergence is zero and, and the bend costs you nothing and you get exactly killing off this term as well. So, so in an Osin frank model, this would be your, your, your pure twist, this is, you think of this as kind of, again, in an unstressed state, this is what the molecules would prefer to do, to be in this kind of a helix or a spiral shape. Okay. Um, now, so we uh, wanted to, to look at, in the same spirit of, of the problem I just told you about, a uh, situation where, where the, the twist is the most expensive term. So again, we looked at, a, we relaxed the, uh, the unit, condition by saying, let's look at a Ginsburg Landau potential. So there it is down here, one over epsilon u squared minus one squared. Uh, um, and we took the, the, the coefficient of twist to be something order one and the, threw all the other deformations, if you will, into, into, into something small. Um, and, and so we took a, uh, to begin with, you might think of a, of a u, which is from some domain into R3, you have your Ginsburg-Landau potential. Here, we took as, just to, to kind of fix ideas, we took as our, our, our twist term two pi n. So somehow we think of this thing as favoring n, n turns, if you will, n twists. Um, so n is, is uh, some, say some fixed integer, though it's not important that q is, in, is two pi times an integer, but it's just easier to think about. Okay, so, so, so this would be, Kind of the analog of what I was just talking about in the case where you're emphasizing uh, twist. Okay. Um, so, well, we, we looked at a two dimensional domain and and did some, ran some gradient flow dynamics. So, what are you looking at here? Sorry if if this. Uh, uh, I hope this doesn't give anybody any headaches to look at this thing. Well, this is. Uh, the following situation. Think of the horizontal axis as the x axis and the vertical axis as the y axis and say a z-axis coming out towards you. So we looked at that model in 2D, 
where we stressed the problem through boundary conditions. On the top, we took the boundary condition one, zero, zero. And on the bottom, negative one, zero, zero. So the, so the U is a map from, from the plane uh, uh, into R3. And what are you looking at here? Well, well so, so um, the, the red curves are just basically where, where U is kind of pointing straight away from you into the negative Z direction. And then uh, the blue curves is where it's roughly the, 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 the this order parameter is pointing out towards you. So what it does is kind of, again, if you think of X is horizontal and Y is vertical and Z coming out towards you, it wants to twist because of the energy. So it twists in the, in the X, Z plane in order to accommodate these boundary conditions, it, which are kind of un incompatible with it, it has to twist like crazy and you get this kind of snake-like pattern. And although this does look pretty bizarre, I admit we were somewhat uh, uh, cheered by this picture because you know, there are these kind of fingerprint uh, patterns, so-called fingerprint patterns in cholesterics. They look remarkably similar to this. So we thought maybe this model, you know, we're kind of on the right track in, in modeling certain kind of cholesteric uh, behavior. On the other hand, we were not cheered by the fact that it looks extremely complicated. Uh, so at this point, we backed off and, well, oh yeah, I guess I forgot, yeah, here, so here's, uh, I forgot to put What was the, oh, question? Yeah, uh, what was the value of N in uh, your picture? Ah, uh, I do not remember it, and I think, yeah, I think it might have been like 10 or something, but I don't remember. Sorry. I mean, yeah, you got kind of similar, picture. similar pictures for, for an, an array of, of n values. Yeah. So this, these are the fingerprint uh, uh, textures I was referring to. So, okay, you know, look, just because an, an energy give, gives uh, pictures that are somewhat similar doesn't mean it's necessarily a, a great model. But, but anyway, so th these, are, these are some actual experiments with color sterics that look somewhat similar. Okay, so at this point we said, well, let's get some, some it looks pretty tricky. So let's look, get some experience by looking at a 1D version of this. So we looked at a situation where U wants to twist around the X axis. So we knocked out the first component, if you will, and thought of it as zero U2 of X, U3 of X. So if I have time, I'll, uh, I can tell you about what happens when you include a third component, but, but it turns out to be even more interesting when, when you look at a situation where, where this thing just wants to to in some sense spin around the x-axis. Okay, now having, uh, so, so we'll take the domain to be one dimension, just a, an interval from zero to one. So our unknown is a map from the unit interval into R2 in this, in this toy model. And, and so I'm renumbering, instead of going through the whole talk with U2 and U3, I'll call them U1 and U2, but bear in mind this, this kind of onsatz. it's really zero, and then I guess what I'm now calling U1, and then what I'm now calling U2. All right, and so if you write down the one dimensional version of that, what I've just been showing you, this is the problem. I'll call it E epsilon. You get a Ginsburg Landau potential, okay. Uh, U squared minus one squared favoring unit length. Here's what the twist term looks like within this ansatz now. Just U1, U2 prime minus U2, U1 prime. Again, remember we're in one dimension, so just, just one derivative here. And again, I'm taking two pi N as the favored uh, amount of, of, of twist. And then the epsilon u prime squared is again, kind of collecting any other deformations uh, here. And so just as in, in the earlier problem, I, we wanna kind of drive this, or if you like uh, stress this system with some, some boundary conditions. So here we, we take Dirichlet conditions, say one to the left, but then we're gonna play with this right boundary condition, some other unit value, uh, say in, in complex form e to the i alpha uh, for, for, the, for the right for the right boundary condition. So we'll play with different alphas to see what effect, <clears throat> excuse me, it has on the problem. So this is the problem I wanna uh, analyze, tell you about what we found. Again, I, I, to be honest with you, we wrote it down originally just thinking, okay, this should be uh, simple and we'll get a little experience and then be brave enough to look at the 2D problem. Uh, and not that it was so complicated, but it, but it certainly for us held some surprises. It, it, and then the, the, the energy landscape turned out to be much more rich than, than we had anticipated. Uh, so I want, that's what I wanna tell you about. Okay, so I've just rewritten the energy here again. Uh, and again, the admissible set I'm denoting by A alpha is just those, those H1 functions with 
with a Dirichlet condition. A, a comment about that, right? For epsilon positive, certainly H1 is the right space. Of course, the whole, the, what, what, what becomes, just as with the first problem I told you about today, what becomes kind of uh, the, the key to the story is that as epsilon goes to zero, of course, you lose that H1 control. You only have control on this twist term. So you don't have control on all derivatives. All right. Um, so some trivial comments. I mean, for epsilon positive, sure, the direct method in the calculus of variations is fine. Yes, there is a minimizer here. Um, and uh, certainly one expects the, the, the uh, uh, for, for epsilon small minimizers, because of the Ginsburg Landau potentials, one is going to want to be driven towards a modulus of, of one. And at the same time, it's, it's going to at least try to twist n times. Right, so those are just some kind of trivial observations about, about this energy. So let's, let me tell, tell you a little bit about what, what happens. Well, so the, 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 the case that doesn't stress this thing at all, I don't know if I should think of, think of this as a psychological examination or a mathematical examination, but, but for the unstressed problem, if you will, where you take the right boundary condition also to be one, in addition to the left boundary condition, then, um, then certainly all the intuition I mentioned in the previous slide is, is, is applicable. So in particular, e to the i 2 pi nx is, is a competitor. It satisfies the boundary conditions and it also twists s times. And so if you plug it into the energy, you know, that kills off the Ginsburg-Landau potential because it's unit valued and it kills off the twist term exactly. So all you have is that epsilon u prime squared term. So, so you get the energy is order epsilon and then uh, life is good. Uh, uh, you know, the only, the, uh, you know, if you split up the, the u, u prime term into the derivative of the modulus and, and a term involving the derivative of the phase, in particular, because of this competitor is order epsilon, the epsilon in front of the derivative of the modulus cancels and you get uniform H1 control on the modulus. And so the modulus, you can then argue, stays uniformly close to one, approaches one as epsilon goes to zero, no surprises. Uh, uh, you can argue, in fact, the solution goes uniformly as epsilon goes to zero towards this, this competitor e to the i 2 pi nx. So not too exciting, no surprises. We didn't stress the system and it does what it likes to do. Okay. Now, um, so, even, so, so now let's, let's allow for more general boundary condition, including the case where alpha is zero, which is the case, remember, of of where the boundary condition at the right is also one. But so the first thing we found is it turns out you can find local minimizers with any number of twists, say M as opposed to N. So here's a, here's a theorem, you know, you pick your favorite integer, pick any boundary condition you want. And for epsilon small, there is a, a local minimizer. It's in H1 for, for epsilon positive. I wanna emphasize the dependence on epsilon and M. So I'll write it in polar form as rho epsilon m e to the i theta epsilon m. And uh, um, there's a minimizer and it, and it, again, it goes uniformly. We even have a, a rate here. It goes uniformly to one in modulus. Throughout this talk, I always use rho for the modulus of my order parameter. So the modulus goes uniformly to one. Uh, the twist, well, it twists. Um, 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 it would like to just, you know, twist n times, right? But but we can find one that twists m times, but plus a little more in order to accommodate the boundary condition. So two pi m plus alpha is the derivative of the the phase, and uh, and here's a formula for the energy. You can see, of course, it's more expensive than the global minimizer. Uh, if, if if you it, it, the, the the energy wants to twist n times, but instead we picked m. So you know the way one might think of this as we're kind of getting minimizers, if you like, in, for any winding number, or if you like, for any homotopy class, roughly speaking. I mean, we, uh, uh, um, so, so you can, you can um, uh, find these, these guys that, that actually are, are locally minimal. Um, just a, a comment on the, a little comment on the proof. I won't say much about it, but here's the story. Um, if you write a competitor, uh, say it's rho cosine rho sine, so your unknowns are rho and theta, then this is what the energy looks like. You know, the Ginsburg-Landau potential becomes rho squared minus one squared. By the way, the twist term in polar coordinates just becomes rho squared theta prime. That's twist. So rho squared theta, theta prime minus your two pi n, and here's your 
derivative in polar coordinates. So, um, so you know, the obvious thing to do would be to say, well, let's minimize where, where the, the phase twists m times instead of n times. So we write down a boundary condition that, that respects the boundary, uh, the, the specified boundary condition. If you let the phase be two pi m plus alpha, then it'll hit the boundary condition. Uh, and then you'd like to just minimize this thing. But the problem is, um, you know, you have, you, you lose control on, on because of this, the, this epsilon here, you don't, you don't uh, have any control on the, on the possibility that rho might want to go to zero. And so you really don't have uh, the compactness you need to push just immediately through the direct method. So how do you get these local minimizers? Um, so so again, here I'm, I'm emphasizing with this rectangle here that you lose control in the direct method because of the possibility that rho might want to go to zero. Now you might say, look with this Ginsburg Landau potential, why on earth would rho want to go to zero? Um, I'll get to that in a little bit, but, but in order to push through something like a direct method, we just turned to a, a constrained approach. We said, well, pick any number between zero and one and carry out your direct method where you're minimizing over, over the rows, the modulus of the original order parameter that, okay, are, as, as required by the boundary conditions are one at the endpoints, but are bigger than or equal to this given positive number everywhere else. So we look at a constrained minimization where theta is, is again, just in H1 uh, with the, the right boundary conditions. So now the direct method is fine. Of course, you, you know, once you, you've kind of uh, constrained away the possibility that you lose compactness with this term, you're, you're fine and you can get a minimizer. Uh, and then, um, so, so that's no problem, but now you're solving an obstacle problem. And as we know, then, you know, the issue is, okay, if you wanna show it's a local minimizer, you have to show it doesn't bump into the obstacle. Uh, and so, um, so that, that's the claim here that I've written down here, that, that local minimizers in fact, completely avoid the obstacle throughout the, throughout the interval. And therefore they truly are uh, uh, local minimizers of the, of the of the original energy that is writing it, you know, in nonpolar form, uh, going back to your variable u, which was e to the i theta. That's a global, uh, globally defined phase, and and everything's great, uh, and and so um, that's that's how that argument goes. One works with the a differential inequality for the for for rho because it satisfies an obstacle, and and a differential equation for theta, and play around with that and. And the, the argument works. So here's the differential inequality because it's an obstacle problem where we perturb in, in rho and, the, and you uh, get a differential equation for, for theta. Uh, you can integrate it up and um, uh, work with that differential equation for theta. Um, so, so that I guess, um, 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 Maybe I, mean, I, I think I'll skip through this, but 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 you can once you once you have good control on on theta, you can push through the argument. Okay, so that's so so what do we ha have so far? So there was the boring case where where uh, the boundary condition was 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 one on both endpoints, and the global minimizer is is what you would expect. We now find that for any boundary condition, you can get local minimizers that twist any integer m times plus a little bit more to accommodate the boundary conditions. So far, everything I've told you involves a modulus that is uh, approaching one, that is uniformly close to one. All right, and again, not surprising given the ginsburg landau potential that, that these global and local minimizers want to have modulus near one. Okay, now, um, it turns out there's another mechanism though. Uh, that can happen here when you when you have an energy that makes twist very expensive. So let's let's uh, um, so so I want to tell you about that a little bit here. So uh, it's so so if you take say a boundary condition that's not one at the at the right endpoint e to the i alpha, then um, then you would say okay then a, then a, a minimizer can't twist exactly it can't twist n times because th then it, it wouldn't end up at the right place at, at the right endpoint. Uh, that, would, that would violate the boundary condition. So you wouldn't expect to have something that's kind of nearly twisting n times uh, for, for either, for, for, for your global minimizer when you have a boundary condition other than one. And even for local minimizers, 
Um, um, you know, we, we have uh, th these guys that are proximate, that are unit modulus approximately, and, and the twist is two pi m plus alpha. So again, it's not gonna, uh, you know, these aren't gonna twist n times, okay. Um, but what we found was um, there is a mechanism by which uh, minimizers, either and sometimes global, sometimes local, could, could uh, on, on most of the domain twist n times. And this is the mechanism in a word. So, so that is, what could happen for epsilon small and positive is a competitor could in a very tiny interval plunge towards zero in modulus. And when it goes down towards zero in modulus, that in some sense frees up the phase to shift, to do an adjustment to, to accommodate the boundary condition without it costing much. So I want, that's what I wanna tell you about really for the, the remaining few minutes here. Um, um, so, Here's a story. So, so, so um, let's take a boundary condition where alpha is, is, is not zero. So, so the, the right boundary condition is not u of one is one, it's something else. And, and so here's kind of the mechanism through these pictures here. So here's a competitor. Uh, later on, I wanna claim this is actually what happens for in some settings for a minimizer, but here's just a competitor one could build. I'll call, I'll put tildes on it. Uh, these, these are so this is supposed to be rho tilde e to the i theta tilde sub epsilon. These, this is a something one can build that's kind of energetically cheap in some sense, uh, and and whose twist in particular uh, is going to approach zero in the epsilon limit. So what one does is this. So let me here's a picture of the modulus on the unit interval. There's some small interval i epsilon, and uh, rho epsilon again plunges down to zero then spend some small amount of the interval, you know, that is I epsilon, where it's zero, and then goes back up to one. So again, if you're familiar with the uh, Modica Mortala or, or Allen Kahn type construction, this is exactly like a, a hyperbolic tangent function or, or half of the hyperbolic tangent. You go down to zero and then the other half, you go back up to one. And during this, so, so, so the, the width of this little transition layer might be, of order epsilon, but then I epsilon could be could be uh, anything really that goes to zero with epsilon, it could be root epsilon, whatever. And then it goes back up over some region or roughly uh, order epsilon. And that is kind of like, uh, you know, that's when the phase can have fun, right? So in this interval where the modulus is zero, I mean, there is no well-defined phase. So, so I draw a phase here, I draw a function theta. This is supposed to be under a microscope and in a blown up picture about i epsilon. So in some little interval, uh, say i epsilon tilde, theta epsilon makes this jump from 2 pi nx, so that has twist n, to 2 pi nx plus alpha. That also has twist n. But now it's, it's made its move and now it's gonna hit the boundary condition later on. So this is a mechanism for accommodating the boundary condition and keeping the twist Ex, you know, killing off the twist term, if you will. Uh, um, and, and so, um, but, so what, but what, in the epsilon limit, you can see the phase is, under, is going to undergo a, a, a jump, a jump discontinuity. Okay, so um, let's look at that construction energetically. So I've written the, uh, the energy in terms of uh, the, uh, split it up, grouping the Ginzburg-Landau potential and, the, and the, the derivative of the phase term. So again, this looks like this is exactly the modica mortala energy. Uh, so, so there, the energy you know over that 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 interval i epsilon is just modica mortala energy going from one down to zero and then from zero back up to one, and then the rest of the stuff. So there's the the, the derivative of the phase term. So so you know look, the the the, the phase is just linear. Uh, most of the time. And so, so this is just going to be, this term will be harmless. This is just going to be order epsilon. Uh, remember over the interval I epsilon tilde, I said theta is, 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 is uh, um, uh, I mean, rho, excuse me, rho is zero. So this costs you nothing. And then here's the twist term, but this is again, uh, most of the time this is gone. It's just exactly the rho squared theta prime is exactly two pi. And so the, you only collect a little bit during that interval i epsilon, but that's a small 
say order epsilon uh, um, transition. Um, and so again, so so you can write down for the modi commercial energy of the Ginsburg Landau potential here, it comes out to be okay, two root two over three. So there is a cost, I'm not saying it's free. There is a cost for the modulus plunging from one down to zero and back up, but okay, that's what it is. And the other stuff uh, is order epsilon. Uh, and so the total energy asymptotically is just this two root two over three. And so, so that's just a construction, but we wanted to argue that in fact, that's exactly what happens if in a certain parameter regime, you know, a parameter regime where, where for example, the, the L is big enough that it's just, it's much, uh, the, the overriding issue is to keep that, en that twist energy small. Um, so here is, here is an artist's depiction of what I've just described. Uh, uh, at least if, if you're willing to call me an artist. So that's a debatable. But anyway, here, here is, here is uh, my attempt to draw this thing. So you, you, know, you hit the boundary conditions at the, at the right and the left end point. You're just spiraling along. And then somewhere in, in, in some small interval, down goes the modulus down to zero. And there, there you, the, the phase adjusts to accommodate the boundary condition and then back up to a uniform twist. This is uh, what, what the construction's doing, but then we, we actually, uh, in the last minutes here, I wanna maybe uh, show you how one proves that this is what happens. And in fact, one numerically, one also sees this as well. So, um, so how do we capture this? The idea is that, um, you know, this, uh, if, if you, if you uh, have, say, a, uh, as, as another competitor, if you like, something that stays very close to one in modulus, then that's uh, um, going to cost you uh, a little bit of, of twist energy because the twist is not, you know, n all the time. It's, there's this extra alpha. So it costs you when you write it down uh, L alpha squared. So the idea is it's a fight between these two possibilities. The one where you accommodate the twist, uh, but, but, but have this kind of modicomortal a jump. And the one where you say, okay, I'll, 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 co I'll cost myself a little twist in order to hit the boundary condition. And so this is, the, you know, so in terms of a parameter regime, it's exactly when you have this inequality that we prove, in fact, the, the minimizer does want to plunge down to zero. Uh, so, so one can phrase this in terms of gamma convergence uh, as, as with the, the first model I told you about. So let me kind of finish with that. Um, uh, so, so you have to, you know, with, with gamma convergence, you have to think about what, what do energy bounded sequences do? Uh, how can they behave? How bad can they be, if you will? And so in the limit, they can have any number of phase jumps. And so the, the gamma limit is going to have to have a term involving the jumps. And so here's what it looks like. So the, 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 what we claim is the gamma limit is defined for functions that are H1 away from a finite collection of points, a jump set. These are, I call it J. So there's some finite number of points where the phase could hop from one value to another. But away from that, your competitors are in H1. And so here you have, okay, this is, remember, this is just the twist term. Um, and then you have, anytime you have this kind of phase jump, you pay this two root two over three. So you have two root, three over, two root two over three times the number of jumps, which if you like the, the zero dimensional house door, uh, you know, counting measure of, of the jumps, that is just the number of jumps. And, and let's say plus infinity if you're not in this, in this case. But anyway, so here I just wanna remind you of, of what I uh, uh, talked about in the very beginning which was that, that other model where the splay was expensive. Remember when the splay was expensive in that other model, what happened on the limit is, okay, the energy could either, involves bulk splay, but also if it's too expensive to splay, it might jump in order to save some cost of splay. And now we're finding, okay, if you penalize twist, then in the limit, you get the cost of the twist, but also, a cost, uh, uh, you, you could, in order to save on twist, you could jump in the phase. So it's, so there's a strong analogy and, you know, in general, I think, you know, we're exploring other models, but I think in general, somehow the moral seems to be when you penalize a certain elastic deformation uh, heavily more than others, then maybe to accommodate that high cost, the, 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 the minimizers might want to undergo some kind of jump discontinuity. Um, now one, I should make, one distinction between this and the model I talked about earlier with uh, expensive splay. And that is 
remember that that cost of the display involved the difference in the jump cubed. So the bigger the jump, the more the more expensive. Here, it doesn't matter how big the you know the size of the phase jump. It just matters how many times you jump. So that is one distinction. You know, it, it, it's irrelevant how big the phase jump is. Just how often. Okay. So so that's why I say here the cost, the size of the, the jump is irrelevant. They all cost the same amount. Okay. So so you know. Um, so we, we proved that in L2, you have this gamma limit. And then um, 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 what are, what, so, so here, here, this is just a, a compactness statement that goes with it. You know, for those of you who work with gamma convergence, you know, without compactness, then gamma convergence is kind of useless. But there, there, so there is a, a gamma limit here. If you have energy, uh, sorry, a compactness result, if you have energy bounded sequences, you can extract an L2 convergent subsequence. You can extract uh, a weakly convergent sequence of the phases. You have basically the machinery you need to, to push through uh, gamma convergence, which means um, in particular that minimizers of the gamma limit are going to be limit points of minimizers of the epsilon. And so this is how we prove that that, that funny picture I showed you with the, the phase plunging down to zero really happens in the right parameter regime. So, uh, so you can have uh, th these, these guys will be uh, um, uh, minimizers of the gamma limit, just something with, 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 with twist n basically everywhere except at one point. Uh, and because in the limit that, 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 that region where things plunge goes down to collapses just to a point. One thing we couldn't determine, which I think involves some exponentially small asymptotics is the pref preferred location of the jump. So at some x naught, it, it will prefer to jump if in a certain inequality. Don't worry too much about this inequality. It's really just saying that it's, it's that, that other one I wrote down basically involving two root two over three and alpha uh, squared L. It's just saying if the twist is, is in some sense big in terms of the, the coefficient of twist is big, then yes, it does want to plunge down to zero. Um, and so, um, so that's kind of a proof that, 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 this, that you have this, this mechanism occurring. And so, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with that. It's, it, it, uh, you know, it's, just a, it's just a kind of a toy 1D model. Um, we're, we're now trying to see what we can say about the two-dimensional problem, but, but so far uh, don't have anything to report there. Uh, but but uh, um, I think, again, I guess the general theme is that, that when you penalize certain deformations above others, uh, one might expect some, some kind of uh, aberrant behavior in the sense that, that minimizers in the limit may want to, to experience jump discontinuities in order to accommodate that uh, uh, expensive mode of deformation. So let me, let me finish with that. Thanks, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Peter. So uh, we have uh, room for questions. So Zahir, Zahir Hani has a question. Yes, go ahead, Zahir. Oh, sorry, I was just. Uh, you have to I unmute yourself. Yeah. I thought this was the clapping uh, thing. Yeah. So I'll just lower it. Or... Okay, so, so uh, Radu. Yeah. Uh, hi, Peter. Hi, Radu. Yeah, uh, I have a question. So, so, so um, you have constructed these uh, local minimizers. Yes. Um, by um, asking that uh, the modulus cannot go to zero. So, uh, but, right. but uh, I mean, with this gamma convergence result and looking at the minimizers at the gamma limit, you say, well, okay, you should have a, like a zero jump, right? So, so, you could, so, you could, depending on the parameter regime, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, but let's say that uh, we are in this parameter regime where you have a jump. So, so yeah. is there a proof that uh, when you look to the global minimizer, when you have this frustrating uh, um, boundary condition, do you have a zero and in fact, exactly one zero? Ah, ah, so, one can, ah, let me think. So I, I don't believe that you will, let me think about that. 
okay so so no so i think if you had more than one zero you know you could one, one could maybe argue that that's too expensive since every every uh time you go down to zero it costs you something but does it go exactly to zero or does it just become small i guess we don't have a proof and hmm, my guess is maybe it doesn't actually uh, go to zero maybe it's just small i mean i think it just kind of uh as, as long as it makes that 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 um uh cost of the the phase rapid phase change cheap that's good enough so so no that's a great question so we haven't proven that and my guess is it doesn't equal it doesn't have a zero but i might be wrong thank you mm -hmm. okay so marco you have uh, a question hi peter hi marco so uh, yeah my question is um, uh, a little bit in the direction of what radu asked uh, it, it was interesting maybe uh, you, you is there any chance to understand what happens when uh, the your number n goes to plus infinity so i don't yeah. yeah. think and whether this is related to somehow there is some kind of uh, payoff between this n and epsilon and also in terms of uh, how many oscillation you need to do and things like that so we did i didn't talk about what so we also looked at the case where n is basically uh uh one over epsilon essentially mm -hmm. and uh so uh what what were, what were we able to say about that one thing maybe not so surprising is one argues that the the global minimizer then weakly goes to zero right it's spinning and spinning and spinning and more and more around the x-axis and so you have a weak limit at zero and then uh we could also if you kind of subtract it off in some sense the infinity part the infinite part of the phase then we could argue that you get kind of a linear tra uh, transition that, that's left over for the phase itself so we did we did look at that because partly uh, you know i mentioned this uh, experimentalist lavrentovich i mean he he talked to us about certain materials where you have you know a huge twist uh, you know, you have a lot of twists, where, you know, on the kind of microscopic scale. And so we do, I think that is an interesting parameter regime to look at where you have asymptotically infinite twist. Uh, so again, we, uh, we did a little bit with that, but uh, particularly in higher dimensions, that would be quite interesting to explore further. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Marco. So other questions? Uh, if yeah, Attendee we... want to... Yes, Wafa, go ahead. Yes, I don't know if it's a comment or a question. So uh, speaking about the analogy between uh, the models, uh, I can see that uh, this is a little bit uh, analogous to uh, the case uh, happening in the context of superconductivity. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, you have a sample and you apply a magnetic uh, field there, and uh, then our state uh, when it's uh, uh, may be difficult to uh, stay uh, equals to one everywhere. So it, do, it does this jump to zero. And uh, uh, we have uh, these uh, vortices, the formation of these vortices. Uh, so I don't know. There, uh, for example, uh, we have uh, what's called the Aprikosov uh, lattice, uh, where we have these uh, zeros uh, of our U. So in your case, uh, do you have, uh, if you are uh, uh, working in two-dimensional uh, sample, do you have uh, some idea if you have some form of lattice of something? Well, so that's, that's a great because... comment. Right, right. So there definitely is an analogy there. I think I haven't seen any evidence of that. One thing is, uh, one distinction is, let's say if we talk about two-dimensional problems, is that um, somehow the the... The, the the defects if you will the the the, the places where there's trouble seem to be you know it, it seems to be kind of co-dimension one so you're going to have these curves where there's trouble yeah as opposed to as opposed to ginsburg landau where you have the point vortices uh, mm -hmm. but, but yeah but but i have not at least say in, in numerical experiments we've done i have not seen uh um lattices come up i'm sure there are but on the other hand certainly in other contexts of liquid crystals there definitely are settings where you see lattices emerge, especially as you, yes. so if you start applying fields, then, then I can imagine you could induce a lattice. So yeah, there's a strong, certainly a strong analogy between these models and, and, and Ginsburg-Landau models and superconductivity. That's a, that's a good comment, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so other questions? 
So if attendees would like to ask questions, they simply can raise hand and we allow them to speak. So, so apparently 